Okay, so we come towards the end. Uh, I apologize, yesterday I was perhaps a little bit too quick on some subjects, and the reason why I was a bit too quick is perhaps that these are the furthest away from uh, uh, the, the direct interest of uh, most people in the audience. But I hope you got the, the main point, namely that uh, there are different strategies to look for uh, uh, dark matter, in particular for a wide class of uh, dark matter candidates, what I call WIMPs, weakly interacting massive particles. Uh, you may have uh, at least three big classes of uh, search criteria. You can try to produce them at colliders associated with something else. Uh, you can try to look for the recoils uh, of nuclei hit by these particles uh, in underground detectors, or uh, the topic I'm going to treat today indirectly. And for the uh, few words I wanted to say about direct detection, uh, the, the challenge of these experiments, I, I try to convince you, is not that much in the theory involved in the, in the calculation of the signals that you have once you have a, a putative signal, a putative candidate. Uh, the problem is, right, is to try to infer the, the size, for instance, of the, the ball that is hitting your uh, billiard ball just by looking at the recoil of this, part, uh, of this ball here uh, and without knowing the velocity or the incoming direction of the other one uh, and fighting uh, against the radioactive uh, background, fighting against uh, maybe poorly known um, uh, foregrounds that you, you thought should not be there, but they are there, th sometimes discovering radioactive species, right, in your stable uh, target. So um, each technique has its own uh, advantages and uh, difficulties, and today I will focus on indirect dark matter detection, in particular WIMP, although I will uh, enlarge a little bit uh, the, the definition in, uh, uh, in some cases to highlight some differences that may arise in some signals if, uh, for example, your, part, the, your particle is not annihilating, is rather, is rather decaying. And uh, uh, here is the outline. Uh, basically, I cannot cover all potential indirect ways to, to probe uh, dark matter. I will focus on a few um, characteristic ones, gamma rays, neutrinos, charged cosmic rays. Uh, I will spend a few words also on uh, constraints coming from uh, CMB. Uh, and uh, and uh, I will... I will um, just trying to wrap up on uh, what are the actual perspective to discover something from, from this strategy. And uh, um, I will leave out uh, a few interesting indirect probes like radio waves, uh, X-ray, that I briefly mentioned yesterday, maybe as some of you in the question time for uh, uh, searching for alternative dark matter candidates like could be sterile neutrinos which are decaying. Um, there might be other constraints coming from energy transfers, for example, in, uh, in, in stars. Uh, and uh, um, there are many techniques now being developed uh, to search for a peculiar anisotropy patterns, for instance, in gamma rays, but not only in gamma rays, that might be associated to dark matter. This, I think, is uh, more specialized than the frontline research. So, but I had, I'd be happy to talk about that in, in the questions. So. What does it mean uh, to search for dark matter indirectly? It means that you don't detect directly your dark matter particle, rather something this dark matter particle does. In general, through uh, um, final states in the standard model, uh, produced through annihilations, through decays, or maybe through interaction of this uh, particle in some remote objects. Okay? So, Typically, this indirect dark matter strategy is the closest one to astrophysics and cosmology. Um, and uh, in a sense, it's, uh, uh, it's challenging because you don't have your, your particle uh, directly produced either in your collider or directly interacting in your uh, detector. However, it's also the most natural way you can think of discovering through other probes dark matter for the simple reason that all probes that have given us uh, hints of dark matter are indirect, in a sense, are gravitationally based. Um, and uh, in reality, the importance of these probes is that they can give us access to other type of uh, characteristic uh, 
um, that cannot be probed directly in the lab, even in principle. So uh, it's sort of a necessary um, uh, program that you have to pursue. Now, as I try to insist you insist on you on in the previous two, 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 two lecture, there is no guarantee that there, that there will be any indirect signature associated to, uh, to dark matter. Uh, most dark matter models predict some sort of associated signal either in collider uh, or in direct detection or in indirect detection. Um, but there are also models that predict none of them. Uh, so uh, be ready to take the risk. Um, and again, uh, I'll focus on the mostly on WIMP and this uh, electroweak scale paradigm, but you may have plenty of uh, uh, real signals, not only at GVTV scale, uh, but you may have really down to, to, to very low energies. And uh, I, won't, I won't insist further on this, uh, on this caveat. So in our simplified diagram that I drew already yesterday, uh, what the indirect detection means, that means that we are trying to look to this direction for WIMPs, namely residual annihilation of particles that are um, gravitating, for example, in, in potential wells could be the, the inner part of our galaxy or the whole half of our galaxy or external galaxies uh, or dwarf uh, satellites of our galaxy into final states which are standard model, okay? Um, of course, uh, one appealing feature of this uh, uh, paradigm for searching for WIMPs is that in principle, uh, as I described, this kind of process is the same kind of process that happened in the early years, that determines somehow the, the, the setting of the abundance that dark matter has. And so you remember this computation of the Y parameter that has to match then the, the, the Planck determined uh, a value for omega uh, dark matter. So in general, one of the hopes is that once you measure some signal, you will be able to infer something on the, on, the, on the value of this sigma v and, of course, of the mass in such a way that you can try to check if what you are seeing is consistent with a, an object that formed in the early universe by the mechanism we were discussing yesterday. Okay? There is some caveat because uh, this link is only present if sigma v is uh, very weakly dependent on the energy of your particle. Uh, more technically, for instance, when, when the annihilation goes through S-wave um, and uh, there, you are far away from resonances and uh, there is not big role of co-annihilations and so on and so forth. Uh, but in general, uh, uh, if this is not the case but you are uh, very confident in a specific model, you can still correct. You can still uh, predict somehow the link between the early universe and present day uh, annihilation. Uh, and, of course, the signatures do depend on different channels. So it's not uh, equivalent to search for any candidate in gamma rays or neutrinos or, or uh, charged particles. To some extent, you expect that the normalization should not be widely different between different channels. But, uh, again, do not underestimate the creativity of uh, model building. Uh, and then there is an important point, is that the, the rate of these processes depend on the astrophysical uh, distribution of dark matter because this process can only happen when the concentration of this particle is high enough, which means that you need to know where to look uh, uh, in places where you do expect to have large dark matter densities. And uh, uh, this is particularly the case I would show for, for photons, for gamma rays. What are the peculiarities of gamma rays? Gamma rays, as you know, are neutral, so they retain the directionality. So it means that if you get a gamma ray in this direction, it's coming from that direction, uh, which is a good thing because we can hope to use uh, uh, directional information. They are relatively easy to, direct, uh, to detect, but do not say so to a gamma ray experimentalist that worked 10 years or more to, to build Fermi and launch it. But uh, compared to other probes are relatively easy. Um, and uh, there is a lot of background, unfortunately, in the sense, or fortunately for astrophysics, of course, uh, uh, there are lots of objects in the galaxy or in external galaxies that do emit gamma rays. Okay, so it's not a, a, a clean search. Uh, now, um, you might have seen, or if you didn't uh, yet, uh, I'm, I'm reporting it here, the flux of gamma rays, well, too bad. The flux of gamma rays uh, 
differential flux. This is a flux per uh, differential in energy, per unit surface and solid angle. My is usually written in the form that I'm reporting there, but let me try to, to describe where the different pieces come from. You have a, um, a particle physics component, which is just the, the differential spectrum of, uh, for example, photons produced in uh, one event. Okay, and then you have to count how many events happen per unit time, per unit uh, volume, uh, integrate along the line of sight. So again, it's the usual formula. You remember the collisional term that we, we had something like n1 square n1 n2 sigma v. This describes something like the the rate of uh, annihilation per unit volume per unit time. Okay, and uh, here it's the same you have something that is rewritten as the dark matter density over the mass of the dark matter square, which is this n square factor. You have sigma v. You have a factor 4 pi that comes from, um, from um, uh, the solid angle, because this is normalized to solid angle. And then this is per unit volume, so you integrate along the line of sight this, let's say, it's a reference value. And here you have some rho over reference value square of your, of your uh, uh, density. And then there is a factor, a factor that is typically two for uh, self-conjugated uh, dark matter like, uh, like uh, Majorana particles, for instance. Might be four if it's not the case. Why? Because only uh, if you have, if you have uh, um, for example, a Dirac particle and the dark matter is not coincident with, uh, with its own antiparticle, uh, what happens is that only one half of your particle are good targets to annihilate with, okay, for each dark matter particle. Only, only the particles that have opposite charge as you are good targets, okay? So in reality, the real density that should enter would be rho half square, so you get a factor four in that case, or a factor two larger if it's uh, a Majorana particle. Now, uh, this you can check gives you this expression, and typically people describe it as a product of a particle physics factor and an astrophysical factor. Now, there are some uh, uh, caveats why, why this is astrophysical, because it only depends on how dark matter is distributed and on the direction you are looking at. Omega here is the solid angle and uh, uh, is in general dependent on where you look at. Now, there are some caveats. This is only true if sigma v here is independent on velocity. Otherwise, it's the same trick we saw yesterday for direct detection. You should uh, integrate over the velocity distribution. Um, uh, and if prompt emission dominates. Of course, if your gamma rays do not come directly from the event of the annihilation that I was sketching before, but they come from, say, energy losses of the other say, of these charged particles in the final state, the charged particles might propagate a bit and then emit a gamma ray. Of course, the previous equation does not work, and we will see how to deal with that uh, later on. Now, let me just uh, make some remark on the astrophysical factor. Uh, unfortunately, take the case of our galaxy. Uh, what we expect for the highest dark matter uh, signal uh, it's, it's that it comes from the inner part of the galaxy. But the inner part of the galaxy uh, is, is actually the region where uh, not only the astrophysical backgrounds are higher, but also the baryonic to dark matter uh, ratio is higher. Okay? So uh, it means that in reality, in the inner part of the galaxy, although the density of dark matter is expected to be higher, um, the baryons dominate the total potential which means that observationally, you cannot very well determine which part of your gravitational potential is due to dark matter. It's almost consistent with zero, with the large error bars, okay? Uh, that means that you have to rely on somehow simulations or theoretical assumptions to know what's the expected profile that dark matter has and so this function rho in the inner part of the galaxy. This is just an example, some sketched uh, models that have been proposed either fitting simulations, NFWs now, or Frank and White, it's based on dark matter on the simulations, and then you have others that have been argued to more closely follow some uh, simulations when you include baryons or sometimes just uh, 
fitting function for rotation curves. And you see that in the inner galaxy, if you really go to, to parsec scale, you have uncertainties that are of several orders of magnitude. This is part of the problem, okay? You cannot really predict. Uh, where, where, your, where your signal is maximal, it's also maximal your uncertainty on your signal, okay? Um, this is a different uh, state of affairs for, for, um, for decaying dark matter particles. Why this so? Because the decaying dark matter correspondent of this formula that I'm writing here and I'm reporting here would be just uh, uh, entering the, 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 the rate, the decay rate, which is one over the, the, the lifetime of your particle, and then here replacing the sigma v. And here you would have just the, the density of your of your dark matter particle integrate of your dark matter halo integrated along the line of sight. Now, this is much more constrained. First, why? Because somehow you can immediately realize that something like the integral over the whole volume of rho must give you the total mass of the dark matter in your halo, right? And this is somehow related to the quantity uh, that you are uh, uh, seeing here. So it's a sort of uh, projected density. Uh, but you have a, a, a constraint which is much more close to it. Um, and second, since it doesn't enter as a square uh, power, it's not enhancing this huge uncertainty in the inner galaxy. So uh, depending on the type of dark matter candidate that you are looking at, the indirect signal may be more or less uncertain. Okay, this is another example of the interplay of uh, you know, the particle physics part with the astrophysical part that is of interest. So where to look for? Again, I told you, you have to look at simulations to, to, to have an idea. This is just one example, not even one of the updated ones. But it's a, a sky map in galactic coordinates of a typical uh, dark matter annihilation sky. Uh, you recognize some, uh, some, uh, some features. This is a a made up uh, intensity, so you should think as the normalization of this plot to be almost arbitrary. Uh, but you see clearly something at the galactic center which is prominent, okay? You see some uh, uh, important shadow uh, in a big region in the inner halo. Then you see some uh, spots here and there. These spots are either due to uh, substructures in our galaxy, like uh, satellites of our galaxies, dwarf galaxies, and so on, or to external objects like uh, clusters of galaxies far away. And then you don't see it, but uh, the, the minimum of this map is not at zero, but you have a sort of diffuse glow that comes from uh, um, the outskirts of the halo in which we are immersed and the extragalactic sky. So each one of these is a potential target for the search of dark matter through through gamma rays uh, in the case. And each one of these has specific uh, features. So let me describe uh, no, uh, soon a few of these type of uh, searches and the specificities that they have. Um, before that, um, let me spend a few words on the other piece entering the, the previous equation, namely the particle physics factor, this, this spectrum here, OK? now. Uh, how reliably you can predict this spectrum? It turns out that uh, for astrophysical standards, once you have a model, you can predict this astrophysical spectrum quite well. Um, why this so? Because if you have dark matter particles going on, uh, annihilating at scales which are, say, hundreds of GeV, more or less you know the physics of these objects once you specify your model of dark matter, in the sense that once I tell you Dark matter is going to annihilate into gauge bosons. I know what's the, the, the um, to, to have good approximation, I know what's the, the fragmentation and, uh, and decay processes associated to that. This is standard model physics. And I can predict how many gamma rays will result as, a, as, a, uh, as the final result of this process. Now, you have two qualitatively different um, signals. One is this sort of um, showering and uh, cascading and uh, fragmentation and decay of all the standard model particles which are unstable. Hmm? So they are not photons, but they will produce photons uh, uh, eventually. And this is uh, a prompt continuum spectrum, and you predict with tools which are typically of the 
typical of the particle physics community, like Pythia. What I'm showing here is some examples of this, uh, of this spectra for different final states. Uh, you may have heavy quarks, you may have gauge bosons, and you see that they are relatively similar. Uh, there are some differences if you go, for example, to leptonic final states. Um, but again, the, the uncertainties on this is uh, relatively modest once you specify your model. Once you tell me how likely it is your dark matter to go into tau plus than, uh, rather than, rather than uh, quarks, for instance. Uh, there are other photons, the, the, the secondary photons, which are associated with the fact that you do produce as endpoints some electrons and positrons. These electrons and positrons can lose energy, but the energy loss of electron and positron sometimes turns out to be ga gamma rays. So this produces additional stuff. And in order to deal with that, you need to describe the propagation of electrons and positrons. And we'll try to briefly attack this problem later on. So it's much more complicated. Uh, but there is a qualitatively different type of photons that you might expect. And these are uh, lines. So you may have a dark matter diagram of the sort Again, I'm only using this Feynman, Feynman diagram as, uh, as I would say, toy uh, pictures. But in principle, you may think of having something like that. This is your dark matter particle. And these are photons. Or you may have something different, like uh, these dark matter particles. You may have, uh, for, for instance, one photon and uh, something else, which might be a, a Z boson, might be also a Higgs boson, et cetera, et cetera. These are expected to arise. But you should immediately tell me, come on, it cannot be. You told us that dark matter is, is neutral, uh, does not couple with visible light. So I cannot attach, really, a photon to dark matter. Otherwise, this would behave like an electron. In reality, in quantum field theory, you have higher order processes. So inside this uh, unspecified blob, I can have some virtual particles. And those virtual particles may be charged. And there, I can attach photon lines. And this is exactly what, uh, what the, the, the sketch there uh, tells you. But there is a price to pay. What's the price to pay? That I have to attach more lines, which means that here I have extra vertices, extra couplings of these particles, the, the, the ones circulating in my, in my unspecified loop. So it means that these kind of final states are suppressed are suppressed by powers of the coupling. In particular, you expect a suppression which is of the order alpha square parametrically with respect to the main diagrams uh, of annihilation of, of uh, dark matter, which means that you have to fight a, a, a suppression factor which is of the order of 10,000. So you should see 10,000 more photons coming from the processes, uh, the continuum that I showed you before, than from this one. Now, the good news of this process is that since its energy is equal to the mass of my particle or related to the mass of my particle by simple algebra, these are very sharp features. These are very robust features. If I was sure that I had seen a line, a photon line of, say, 190 GeV, there is basically nothing in astrophysics that can mimic it. Okay? Unfortunately, before I see 10 photons of this sort, I should have seen like uh, uh, 100,000 photons of the other type. And most likely, I would have convinced myself that that was a detection of dark matter. Of course, there are some clever theoretical ideas to try to overcome that. But this is, uh, again, another proof of no, no free lunch theorem in, in physics. Uh, yes? Right, this is, this, yeah, so here I'm talking about annihilation, but uh, yesterday I, I, I touched this point. The, the point is exactly that you need some, uh, some protective symmetry, because otherwise uh, any standard model that you add to your BSM uh, model, typically is and any new particle that you add to uh, whatever scenario of standard model is unstable unless there are reasons that keep it stable. So most models, um, uh, just rely on the fact that there is some uh, 
protective symmetry, this was this uh, uh, Z2 sort of parity symmetry I was talking to you before. One of the appeal of, uh, say, supersymmetry was that you might relate this to R parity and so somehow to a residual discrete symmetry, which might have to do with other empirical facts, like the fact that you don't see uh, easily produced these particles at colliders because they should have been produced in pairs, uh, the fact that you don't see proton decay, et cetera, et cetera. But in principle, it's not uh, necessarily decay. You don't, it, might be, it might be a different type of uh, symmetry. It might be a gauge symmetry. It may be, uh, you just think of the standard model, right? You may have uh, different particles that are stable because of different reasons, right? Uh, the lightest neutrino is just stable because of uh, Lorentz symmetry. It's the lightest fermion, and, and basically, how can it decay into anything else, uh, you may have gauge symmetry preventing a, a, a decay to happen, or it may just be accidental, because if you have particles which are only coupled very, very, very weakly, gravitationally, they might not be stable, but they decay on very long time scales. Okay? Here I'm talking about annihilation, so in principle here, if there is a symmetry that is of the type parity, this symmetry is preserved, because even if this is as parity minus one in this uh, uh, this one, here you have a final state which has uh, minus one, minus one. Here is plus one, plus one. So you are safe. Uh, you conserve this, uh, this symmetry. But uh, this is an important uh, question on, on why you can, uh, I mean, addressing the stability of your dark matter candidate is one of the strongest theoretical constraints in model building. Now, uh, how do you detect these gamma rays? There are two main classes of telescope. I should say three, but let's say two main classes of telescope. Either you go in space and you launch a, a, a tracker and calorimeter that tries to see, uh, for example, the pair production of a photon in a medium, and uh, you see the pairs. Uh, this is the case of Fermi, and then you reconstruct the incoming direction, but uh, there you really see the photon inducing your pair, or you try to see from the ground with arrays like MAGIC or HES and VERITAS, you try to see the Cherenkov uh, light induced when uh, one such uh, high energy photons triggers a shower in the atmosphere, starts interacting in the atmosphere, produces particles. These particles are superluminal in the medium, okay? Have, uh, and so they, they emit Cherenkov light. They multiply, they redistribute their energy, and then the challenge is that you have to separate the photon-induced Cherenkov light from the hadron-induced Cherenkov light, and this has been, uh, uh, is a technique that has developed, uh, I would say, in the 80s, basically, and now it works very well. These are very different. These can have a very wide field of view, but uh, it's limited in collecting area to, to whatever you can launch in space, and usually you cannot launch something that is much bigger than, than that, uh, and, uh, or unless you are very rich. Uh, and, uh, uh, well, basically, uh, it stops at hundreds of GV. Here it's the other way around. The higher in energy, the easier it is to, to trigger uh, a detectable, a recognizable shower. But you have a limited field of view, although you have a huge area. So, for example, for large-scale studies, this is much better than this one. For point-like or small objects this, and high energies, this might be better than that one. And then there is a third technique. Uh, which is basically traditional, more traditional linked to cosmic ray detection, which are pools. Now the new generation detector of this sort is, is Hawk. Um, so just to say that you cannot detect anything with everything or uh, you, you have some limitation. Uh, what this kind of experiment see uh, is something like that. This is the sky uh, seen by, by Fermi, but a uh, very old one, but enough to recognize that it's quite crowded. You see some diffusion emission. You see several type of dots on this map with different colors, different beasts, and so on and so forth. And this doesn't look like the nice simulation map that I was showing you before with a big spot here and a few spots here and there. So it means that what you're looking at is mostly astrophysics, and then the challenge is to disentangle it. Okay. Um, and the same is true for, for the Cherenkov telescope. They can narrow down their search to a specific area, take the galactic center, and even there you see different things. You see some uh, different beasts. You may see point-like emissions, 
look at these, it looks almost like the dark matter one, right? Uh, but then you look at the spectrum, it's almost power, uh, a power law featureless. It doesn't match what you should expect. So most likely this is astrophysics. And then even if you try to remove these objects, you may see some diffuse radiation. But clearly, this diffuse radiation has nothing to do with dark matter. Look at the shape. It's elongated along the galactic uh, plane. So clearly, you have to fight all these uh, uh, astrophysics. And that's most of the challenge, right? Uh, just to give you some idea of the constraints and the reach of these experiments. Yes, please. Yes. Yes. It has to be close to us? That's the question? No, no, I'm asking that it's extremely high energy Yes. It comes with from the annihilation process, right? So, so it comes from there. Yes. 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 No. And the reason is exactly the same diagram I'm showing here. Well, they will interact if it's a WIMP like dark matter, but with a, such a suppressed rate that you can forget about it. Yes. Right, but do, uh, this, is a, uh, this is exactly the same kind of uh, 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 trick that can happen. If I ask you, what's the probability for an electron in the intergalactic space to interact with a CMB photon, the answer is not very low, in fact. It has a high probability that over its propagation lifetime, it will eat a CMB photon. If I ask you, what's the probability that a CMB photon will interact with an electron, this is a very small number, OK? So, don't, don't, so the point is that this is a very rare process. When it happens, you have gamma rays. It doesn't mean that since this happens from time to time, then every time you have a photon sitting in dark matter, it will interact. And uh, OK, just to give you some sensitivity and some searches that have been performed, um, one very powerful search is these little dots that I was showing in the map, the satellites of our galaxy, dwarf satellites. This is a pictorial view of a few of them in the surroundings of our uh, Milky Way. And uh, uh, what typically Fermi has been doing, but also Cherenkov Telescope have been doing, they search for in, around this, this uh, this direction for excess photons with respect to, say, diffuse astrophysical uh, expectations. And in order to enhance their sensitivity, they stack them. They sum somehow all these patches, and they see if there is a, a collective excess. And the result is negative, and so they can put bounds on the how, uh, what's the rate of annihilation of dark matter. This is one recent bound from, from Fermi. So everything that is about this blue curve uh, is, uh, is disfavored, if not excluded. These are uh, preliminary results. These have been some regions preferred by some hints of excesses elsewhere in the galactic center. And this is for a specific channel in heavy quark, in particular BB bar. OK, the only good thing that I want to point out is that these dashed lines is something we should be familiar with by now. Namely, this is the rough order of magnitude of this wind miracle I was talking about. Namely, if you have a particle of the order of, say, uh, 30, 40 uh, GeV in mass, uh, and all the, the baseline story I told you about what's the ideal uh, toy model, uh, non-relativistic Rayleigh candidate that fulfills all these conditions about matching omega uh, dark matter, etc. well, the annihilation cross-section that you would expect is at this level. So it means that these experiments are probing exactly the range of you know, electroweak scale mass. These hundreds of GeV mass is exactly the same scale of the Higgs, say, okay? with the kind of cross-sections, the kind of couplings that are uh, suggested by this uh, WIMP miracle argument. So although there is no firm de uh, detection, the good news is that we are starting to test uh, the, the interesting parameter space. Okay. Uh, of course, the technique can be repeated for uh, um, Cherenkov te telescopes. Here, the sensitivity is much lower in terms of cross-section. However, they can extend wider uh, masses. Uh, 
So maybe our picture of how dark matter formed is completely wrong. The mass of dark matter may be 5 TeV, 10 TeV, and the cross-section being higher. These are testing this kind of, uh, uh, say, failure of our theoretical intuition. Till now, no detection. Uh, of course, it's not the only bright place I was showing you uh, before in this simulation map. Another bright place, if you remember, was this sort of extended halo around the galactic center. Okay? Now, uh, uh, there have been studies, for example, in Fermi, for the radiation coming from bands which are sufficiently far away from the galactic plane. Why this so? Because here you see that there is a mess. It's plenty of astrophysical objects. So somehow you know that dark matter signal should peak here, but you say, okay, I don't know how to describe well my background. Here it looks like a better place to look at. Uh, it's a compromise choice. Uh, they did it, and in fact, they derived constraints in the same plane, cross-section mass, which is comparable. Maybe a little bit worse, maybe a little bit better according to the channel you look at. But why this is different? Because now this is depending on something completely different from what I showed you before. What I showed you before was the stacked uh, collection of these satellites of the Milky Way. You have to try to infer the mass of dark matter in each one of these from the rotation curves, for example, of the, of the uh, few stars that you may see there. So uh, it has different types of systematics and challenges. Here, this signal comes from the bulk of the Milky Way signal, including relatively local uh, um, part of the sky. Why? Because by, by just geometric effects, if I look at 10 degrees above uh, the galactic plane, I also cross relatively nearby region. So again, this confirms the picture that we have sensitivity to this kind of uh, um, uh, dark matter. And if you want to look for the galactic center, what did I tell you about small patches of the sky, very narrow? Maybe, in fact, uh, um, Cherenkov telescopes, these ground-based telescopes are way more sensitive. They have a higher collecting area. In fact, the HES telescope, for, for instance, did that. And they got this kind of exclusion bounds. Uh, these are the strongest exclusion bounds in that energy range. Uh, but you, you see what they had to do. They had to search their dark matter signal from this green area. They had to remove this yellow area. They had to compare this green area region with a similar shaped region elsewhere. Why they did all that? Because it's a mess. They have signals everywhere, so they have to pre-select a region where you expect your signal to be sufficiently strong. So they have to remove you know, objects that are known to exist in the mid there. They have to remove this region, which is plenty of astrophysical photons. And then in order not to fool themselves, they compare the photons that are expected to come from here with photons coming from this funny shaped region. Why? Because there, the dark matter signal is maybe a factor of a few smaller, but the astrophysical signal is expected to be comparable, the unaccounted for astrophysical signal. And so they, kind, uh, they try to, to, to get bounds. Now, these are quite strong, not as strong as to probe the, the paradigm I was talking about yesterday. And these rely on some strong assumption on extrapolation of the profile in this narrow area. But that's the best we can do for uh, this, uh, this kind of situation. Okay? So in order to make further progress, uh, I'm saying order of magnitude progress, probably you need the uh, next generation instruments here. Of course, you can look at something completely different. Uh, the, the residual glow that was happening to be everywhere, this blue sky background that was in the, in, uh, uh, in the map I was showing you. And how do you compute it? Of course, look at this, at this formula, right? If you were to compute now everything that has been emitted from the extragalactic sky, all external galaxies and halos, et cetera, et cetera, this integral has to change. Why? It has to change because now I have to account for the cosmological uh, effect, so my line of sight integral will become an integral over redshift, and I have to account for that. There is another effect. Uh, over cosmological distances, there is some finite opacity for gamma rays, so I have to account for some exponential suppression, which might be possible. And then, of course, the dark matter entering the formula, my reference value for dark matter is not anymore the galactic one, the one that I have to infer with some uncertainty, either from measurements or from uh, simulation, but it's the cosmological one. And so the, the formula that you get looks like that. Uh, 
Hmm? It's exactly the same structure of the formula I, I showed you before, but here now you have the dark matter density square, the cosmological value. Here you have a, a spectrum which has been emitted at some redshift z, so you have to integrate over it. Here you have the absorption factor. These factors come from uh, the square of dark matter density that scales as 1 plus z uh, to the 6th, and then the, the line element that gives you the suppression times the Hubble function depending on z. So it's just a generalization of what I wrote. But the funny thing here is that uh, uh, just like here you had this enhancement due to the, the quadratic dependence of your signal from the dark matter density, here you will depend on, the, on this flux multiplier, which is nothing but the, 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 the square of the density contrast of dark matter, which is nothing but the power spectrum okay, of the dark matter. And this is the way you can compute it. Unfortunately, uh, this, dark, this power spectrum is not computed on the scales where it's linear and so nicely described by our, our cosmological model. You see, this is the, the power spectrum <laughs> basically uh, uh, at, in the limit of r going to zero, namely at very short distances, which is deeply nonlinear. Okay? So, so you have to integrate your power spectrum over wave number up to the end of this spectrum. And you don't know where the end is, by the way. So you don't know how it looks like in the deeply nonlinear regime, and you don't know where the hand is. So you have to devise some uh, tools or guesswork or whatever to try to uh, extrapolate what you know of the power spectrum, including the slightly nonlinear regime, into the deeply nonlinear regime. So the bad point about this is that you have a band of uncertainty for the, no for the integrand of this piece, which is quite large, and depends a bit on, uh, well, a bit, quite a bit, on uh, how you extrapolate, and also on the intrinsic properties of the dark matter. Because something you probably never see is that this spectrum for dark matter is supposed to end at some point. It does not grow forever. And where does it end? Exactly like for baryons, you have some sort of silk damping hmm, that depends on the fact that you dissipate uh, the, the fluctuation on a scale where collisional processes happen. If dark matter interacts a little bit, even if it's a little bit, at some point it will dissipate this fluctuation. And so at some point this spectrum will, will be cut off. And this depends on the physics of dark matter. This is a curse, but also some interesting point, because in principle this signal tells you something about the collisional properties of dark matter. Hmm? Unfortunately, this is a very weak dependence. It's a sort of logarithmic dependence, but... Uh, uh, it just shows you the, the complementarity of different tools to, to different aspects. Again, the situation here is that the constraints coming from Fermi are comparable to the constraints that come from dwarfs. Okay? A bit worse, a factor of a few worse, and a bit more uncertain. On the other hand, they extend to very high masses. Why this so? The reason is exactly due to the fact that you integrate over redshift up to very far away. Now, there are two effects. One is that a photon emitted, I told you that Fermi can only reach up to, say, 100 GeV, 200 GeV energies. However, a photon emitted at redshift 10 at 1 TeV will have energy of 100 GeV right now. So Fermi becomes accessible to much heavier stuff, one. The second point is that there is this, this, uh, um, this suppression, which is indicating that there is some... Uh, um, uh, opacity of these photons in the extragalactic sky, but this opacity is also linked to a possible reprocessing of this energy. What does it mean? In the extragalactic sky, you have a very high energy photon, which from time to time may find, for example, a photon of the extragalactic background light. This is the light emitted by all the stars and, and the dust uh, uh, of all the galaxies in, in the universe, and then it can make a pair if this process is above the threshold. But these, these electrons and uh, positrons, in turn, can interact with a photon, for example, the CMB photons, and have an upscatter. This photon now may have GeV energies, for instance. And so Fermi is sensitive to stuff that has been absorbed also. And this is why Fermi becomes competitive even with Cherenkov telescopes uh, in sensitivity through this kind of analysis. Okay. So 
I'm sorry, here I, I need to be a little bit more qualitative because you see there is a huge variety of phenomenology that you can span. But uh, not all of them are sensitive to the same things. Some of them have difficulties, but these difficulties can turn into advantages to probe things that you cannot probe with other techniques. So this is also what makes this, uh, this kind of uh, approach quite uh, interesting. Now, let me uh, take a sort of variation of this, uh, of this uh, uh, technique, which concerns neutrinos. Now, at face value, neutrinos look like the, the, the poorer version of the gamma ray probe. Why? They are neutral, OK? For sure, they are neutral. Uh, so in principle, you could use them exactly like you use photons. Uh, Unfortunately, neutrinos are so weakly interacting that it's very hard to detect them. So you may see this is like, uh, you know, seeing the, the same sky I was talking about, but with a su significantly suppressed sensitivity. So forget about them. However, there are two uh, important advantages. One is that we know um, many, um, well, less sources of potential astrophysical backgrounds in neutrinos than we know for gamma rays. So in a certain sense, if we had access to the neutrino sky, it would look, we hope, more clean. And the second thing is that um, um, neutrinos do not suffer significant absorptions, just because they are weakly interacting, at least up to some energies, OK? Now you may say, OK, how do I exploit it? We will see in a minute. So the, the, the first thing that we face in dealing with neutrinos is exactly that. It looks like, you know, uh, a hopeless version of the photon probe that we just described. But in reality, uh, the fact that it has, um, of course, there is a limitation which is due to the fact that the probability of this stuff to interact is very low. Just to give you idea, ideas, the, the, the cross section of the a TV energy of these neutrinos is uh, picobarn. So these are kind of uh, particle physics uh, cross section for uh, rare LHC events. Uh, and even at PEV, it's below the nanobarn. So what's the kind of solution we have to envisage to, to detect this? Uh, can we detect, uh, uh, can we build a huge man-made detector which is so big to have insufficient statistics? In reality, what people have been thinking of is to go to natural volumes, huge volumes. When I tell you huge volumes means really huge. This is just in scale, the, the largest neutrino telescope in the world, Ice Cube, compared with the, with the Eiffel Tower. And these are instrumented with uh, Cherenkov detectors, but very sparse. You can afford to be very sparse if you are aiming at very high energies, because the Cherenkov uh, uh, signal might, might be sufficiently uh, extending on a sufficiently large volume that you detect it. And then you have to use natural media. Okay? So just to, for a comparison, this is the largest man-made neutrino detector, Super Kamiokande. And, and, and the, 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 the comparison uh, with, uh, with current neutrino detectors is in, in, in for astrophysical purpose is, is clear, right? You, you cannot think of scaling this size to this size with man-made detector. You have to go to natural media. Uh, if you are wondering why gigaton scale or kilometer cube size has been detected, it's not because uh, Francis Alzen is, uh, uh, is hamming at the highest thing he can it can do is because this is based on estimates uh, um, on the signal that you should expect if astrophysical objects emitting uh, TV radiation, gamma rays, emit comparable number, comparable fluxes of neutrinos. And this is the size that gives you roughly of the order of, say, 10 events per year in neutrinos. So if you want to start to do neutrino astrophysics at TV and PV energies, if the sources of neutrinos are comparable in luminosity to the source of the gamma rays that we see, you should build something like that. Surprise, surprise, Ice Cube saw uh, neutrino flux of astrophysical origin at roughly at this kind of flux. So theories sometimes are clever enough to predict what you should expect. Uh, uh, and just to give you an idea of the sensitivity, to exactly the same kind of searches we, I, I mentioned before to, to, for gamma rays, right? You look at this sky map, you expect some type of signal, and you see what kind of signal I measure, what kind of signal I expect. So what's the largest possible pattern that I expect consistent with the distribution of the data that I have? And this is the kind of plots that you have. 
So the, everything which is above these curves is excluded. Again, these look very weak. The green curves here are, are the Fermi uh, constraints. Okay? So you see that for scales of hundreds of GeV, TeV, Fermi is like uh, hundreds or thousands or 10,000 times better than uh, neutrino telescopes. Are you surprised? I told you that neutrinos interact way less than photons, so somehow you expect photons to win. But there are cases where neutrinos are interesting, which is the high mass. And there is another important case where neutrinos are interesting, which exactly exploits their weakness. They do not interact much, I told you. So what can be, uh, we do with neutrinos? We can try to see signals of neutrino uh, uh, in neutrino, uh, which corresponds to other channels in the absorption regime. So even if we ha are hopeless to see uh, uh, photons coming from uh, deeply opaque regions, neutrinos we can use for that purpose. Okay? And this has been done. And in fact, uh, one thing that is, I think it's a wonderful idea, it was developed, uh, I think, like uh, 30 years ago. Uh, among the first one, if not the first one, there is this nice article by Press and Spergel that you might know for completely different type of physics. Uh, so the idea is the following. I told you that you might have WIMP interaction in underground detectors, okay? And they transfer some little amount of energy or big amount of energy to the target nucleus. But I didn't tell you what happens to the remaining WIMP. Now, if the remaining WIMP has a kinetic energy which is left to, the, to it, which is less, and so a velocity, which is less than the escape velocity from the gravitational body it, it is in, in, in that case the Earth, it will start orbiting the Earth. It will become uh, attached to the Earth. Okay? It's like a small satellite of the Earth, this WIMP. Hmm? Entering the Earth, by the way, because it has interacted underground on some elliptical orbit. Now, it stays there because there is no other mechanism that really pumps up its energy. So at some point, it, it will interact twice. And so it continues losing energy. And soon and soon and soon, it will sink to the center of the Earth. And the same happened in the center of the sun. Now, what happens there? You start accumulating WIMPs. It's like a sort of Swiss bank for, for, for WIMPs. And it's, uh, at, it's exactly at the center of the Earth. And by the way, I think this, Switzerland is the only country that, uh, uh, for which law, you, if you own some piece of land, you own it down to the center of the Earth. So that these things might be related to the accumulation of WIMPs. And, uh, the point is that this is sensitive to the same kind of physics that I described uh, yesterday, namely the interaction, elastic interaction of WIMPs with the target. It's not exactly the same. Why? Because now what is important is not what happens to the recoiling nucleus. It's what happens to the WIMP. So the more the WIMP loses, the easier it is to, for it to get captured. Okay? So you are a bit sensitive to the, to the low velocity end of the distribution, of the FV distribution, rather than high velocity end, which was crucial for the signal to be detectable in underground detectors. Okay, so just if you want to see a formula, this is a simplified formula. Uh, there has been a huge uh, uh, systematization of this theory by Gould in the, in the 90s. But just to describe this formula, this is an integral of the same quantity, right? The density of the dark matter particles uh, uh, that you may find, normalized in this case, for example, to the mass of the sun, integrated over mass shells of the sun, because at each shell, depending on the shell at which, at the distance from the center of the sun at which the wind interacts, the gravitational potential is different. So the probability for it to be bounded uh, to the sun or not is different. So you have to sum over them. It integrates over some function of the, of the, veloci of the velocity distribution, and you get your final results for the capture. But basically, it goes like sigma times rho, which is the same prefactor that we found in direct detection of dark matter. Okay? So it's, it, it's counterintuitive, but you can use these huge, build, huge uh, telescopes to probe somehow the same kind of physics that these small underground detectors can probe. But not by looking at recoil events, but looking by the neutrino flux coming from the center of the sun or the center of the Earth. Hmm? And uh, this is just a cartoon illustrating the same thing. Now, you may say, up to which level WIMP, uh, WIMP particles continue to annihilate? 
Well, it depends on the loss or the heating mechanism, right? Uh, in principle, the, the, the number density of your WIMP in the core of the sun, assuming it's homogeneous, blah, 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 these, if there was only capture, is just given by the capture rate, which scales as the product of the density of the WIMPs times the sigma, the cross-section, okay? It's proportional to this quantity. However, if you an, uh, accumulate too many of them, the probability for them to annihilate will start rising. How does the probability for annihilating scales? It scales with something which is proportional to the square of the number of particles that is present there. So at some point, if these numbers are not ridiculously small compared to the, uh, you know, the, 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 the lifetime of the universe, of the solar system, and so on, you will get a stationary situation where n dot is equal to 0. And so Ca over C will give you, sorry, it's the other way around. Square root is given by the, by the steady state equilibrium value of your, of your uh, population. So what does it mean? It means that you can predict uh, the annihilation rate directly from, from this formula. It turns out that the flux of neutrinos that you should see is just given by basically the capture rate. So the flux of neutrinos measure the scattering of WIMPs, not their annihilation hmm? at equilibrium. So you can put these constraints on the same level of the constraints of underground detectors. And these are the latest results from uh, the ice cube collaboration compared with other detectors like uh, Antares, Baxan, et cetera, et cetera. This is for spin-dependent cross-section. I told you that there are two main ways these particles are expected to interact, either with the spin of the nuclei or with the uh, collective nucleus in a coherent way. This is the constraints for spin-independent uh, cases. Now, again, forget about the details. The only thing that is important is that here, direct detection experiment, stuff that is put in caves underground, has a sensitivity to anything that is above these curves, these gray curves here. So it looks like neutrinos are very bad, okay, compared to this, which uh, should confirm our intuition that this is a loser's channel. However, in the spin-dependent case, it's the other way around. And why it's the other way around, it's easy to think about it, right? The sun is mostly made of protons, and protons do have an intrinsic spin. So somehow the sun is a big spin-dependent detector. Hmm? So the sun wins. The fact that there is lots of protons in the sun win compared to the fact that in a small detector underground, you have only you know, your outer nucleon uh, uh, outside the shell that can compete. So again, keep in mind the fact that different techniques, different probes, make us sensitive to different aspects of the kind of physics we are dealing with. Which means that you should also know a lot of physics in different branches in order to have a more complete picture of what's going on. For now it's relatively easy because we only have constraints. But the day you start having an excess here, and none there. Maybe this is telling you something about the specific nature of the dark matter. Hmm? Now, one thing that is a bit closer to, uh, to cosmology is the, the, the cosmic microwave background. Now, I told you that one of the strongest evidence for uh, the, the, the fact that you need dark matter rather than a modification of gravity is the fact that the growth of structure consistent with the pattern that we see in the CMB and uh, the, what we see nowadays uh, uh, requires these, these additional species. But you can use the acoustic peaks of the CMB uh, and uh, in general the, the, the angular power spectrum of the CMB in a completely different way. Why? Imagine that you have particles that now annihilate after the CMB, uh, after the, the, the recombination time. Hmm? Among the byproducts of the annihilation, shit, you may have things like electrons, positrons, either directly or through some other mediator, for example, Ws or, or Zs or, or heavy quarks or uh, Higgses and so on and so forth. At the end, since these are all unstable, they will produce gamma rays, they will produce neutrinos, and they will produce also electron positrons. 
Now, this stuff uh, does something, right? This is energetic particles in a medium that has recently uh, recombined, so it's a neutral gas. One thing that it can do is to ionize it. But if the gas is ionized, then the optical depth for the photons is not the same. They are way more sensitive to, to a ionized gas. The, the probability for them to interact is much higher. So you might see some signal of dark matter annihilation through the optical depth, the tau parameter that has been introduced even uh, in the first day by David Beinberg. Now, again, I'm simplifying a bit. Uh, uh, you should really take into account of all the correlations because you don't measure exactly tau. You measure some uh, angular power spectrum that depends on n different parameters. But the bulk of the argument is that if you have a knowledge of the tau, uh, uh, the, the, the photons have experienced, you know what's the basically the integrated uh, uh, version of the ionized matter that these photons have crossed. And so you have indirectly a, an upper limit to the amount of positrons and electrons that could have been injected after the, uh, the recombination time. And slightly more quantitatively, uh, how do you compute that? Again, the formula are, are all variations of the same stuff. Okay? Here you care about the energy deposited as a function of the time. You have the same kind of dynamics. You have rho square, you have the redshift effect, and then there is this parameter that is what CMB physicists prefer to constrain. Okay? Uh, which is sigma v divided by 8 pi m square, again the same stuff that we saw again and again, times 4 pi because now this is integrated over the full solid angle, times twice the mass of dark matter. Why? Because this is the energy released by annihilation of an event involving two particles of dark matter, times some function, some number, in principle, it's dimensionless, that tells you how much of this energy is useful to ionize stuff. Okay? And the whole physics is in this function. Now, how much this function, uh, uh, the larger this function is, you would expect that this cannot exceed 1. Okay? In reality, since it's a function of time, it can exceed 1. But, uh, uh, for example, Tracy Slater has done uh, uh, detailed calculations of this function according to the final state your dark matter uh, annihilates into. Not surprisingly here, you see that if dark matter annihilates into electrons and positrons, this fraction is almost comparable to one. Why? Because it's all available for this stuff to ionize and uh, the medium. Not all of it, because some of it goes into heating, for example, of the medium, and it's not useful to ionize uh, photons. So you have to take into account that. Uh, other type of particles are less efficient, but again, you have roughly between 0.1 and 1. This, this function is relatively well known. Roughly at the 10% level, you can compute this function. And uh, practically what it does, the dark matter to the, to the um, uh, electron fraction in the universe as a function of redshift, is to change the standard curve, which is the, the, the black curve that you see here. Here there is no uh, rayonization due to, to stars. Uh, it changes it into this, these different levels of plateau, okay? And the tau function is roughly, uh, is essentially proportional to the integral of this. Hmm? In a surprising way, but by now you should be used to it, uh, the, the CMB constraints that were announced by, by Planck uh, in December uh, 2014 to dark matter, hmm? electromagnetic interaction of dark matter, not gravitational, or, or, or uh, uh, I would say, gauge interaction of dark matter, not gravitational ones, well, it's at the level of the thermal relic. Once again, for particles of the order of tens of, solar, uh, of uh, GV, of proton masses. And uh, I won't describe the other points on this curve. So, once again, you may have very different ways to probe this kind of paradigm. This is quite indirect, okay? So it's very hard that if you see some excess, uh, you can interpret it as a term in terms of dark matter. But in order to put constraints, it's very robust. Here, all structures are linear. There is no uncertainty due to the clumpiness, blah, blah, blah. 
uh, the particle physics is relatively simple. Why? Because the, the physics involves the energy losses of electrons and positrons of energies down to the keV and so on. It's stuff you can study in the lab, basically. Okay? So um, this is very robust. No, uh, the point is that here it's a sort of one-sided thing, right? The, 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 the stuff that dark matter can do is only to, um, to uh, raise the fraction of ionized stuff. Now, what they do in practice, um, they marginalize over, uh, over these, these parameters that are considered for this kind of analysis nuisance parameters. Uh, but again, uh, if you are not willing to to take them for to better than uh, than a few um, tens of percent, these are safe. Um, there is another point. In reality, you are not sensitive to the injection of energy at very low redshift by dark matter. It's what happens at redshift of the order of uh, 500 to 700 that matters. So, in the picture I was showing you, it's really this region that matters. There, there are no stars. There is nothing. It's all linear. <laughs> um, but still, technically, what they do is uh, to marginalize over uh, the other parameters. I, I'm, I'm simplifying because I'm just flashing now the main parameter that depends on this physics. In reality, you have to compute the CLs and blah, blah, blah with a, an enlarged model. And then you just marginalize over all the rest. Hmm? Now we come to the most difficult. Uh, part, because I have no idea what's your knowledge of uh, charged particle propagation, so I will do a, a 10 minutes crash course on uh, diffusion loss equation. Um, so before I lose all of you, let me uh, tell the cartoon version of the story. The cartoon version of the story is that if you want to look for dark matter through charged particles, which means the electrons, the positrons, the antiprotons, and so on, that are emitted, you have to deal with a different type of difficulty, which is that the galaxy, even in a very simplified and theorist picture, looks something like that. It looks like a, 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 a thin disk of gas and stars immersed into a thicker magnetized halo, uh, which very low uh, densities, but with significant uh, uh, magnetic field, which may be regular or turbulent and so on, uh, populated by winds, that are uh, triggered by, for example, star formation activity. Uh, there are magnetic inhomogeneities which uh, uh, allow charged particles to, to scatter on them, and so they propagate in a diffusive way. Uh, there is convection, there might be reacceleration, there are plenty of plasma physics effects. So the, the one uh, formula version of this uh, mess is that the flux now of, say, antiparticles is, not any, is always the product of some particle physics factor times something which is not only a, 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 a function of the astrophysics, but it's a functional of my astrophysical distribution of dark matter and also of all these astrophysics going there. Now, how do you deal with that? Uh, the theory uh, for this kind of processes, so you have to describe this. Uh, this mess. The theory has been established a long time ago, Sirovaski, and in the, in the 60s, basically, we knew that. We knew that we should write some kind of equation, which is a diffusion loss equation. And uh, um, this is just meant to scare you. But, uh, so there is some source, which are unknown. Uh, there is some diffusion term, just special diffusion. There is some energy loss term, Electrons, positrons, electrons can lose energy while propagating. There is some uh, reacceleration, or if you wish, there is some diffusion in momentum space hmm, that changes the energy of my particles due to scattering with inhomogeneities in my medium. So if you wish, these are small-scale electric fields, transient electric fields my particles can uh, find. There might be a convective velocity. In general, there is. There are adiabatic flow term. There is large scale movement of the gas. Uh, and then there are particle physics or nuclear physics processes like the fragmentation and the decay of my particles. And nucleus may interact with gas, may lose one nucleon, and the resulting nucleus might become unstable. So 
uh, I have to take into account for all that. And just to give you an idea of the, of the, the link between these flux variable that uh, these equations are usually written in uh, with respect to the phase space distribution, it's just the P squared, the integral over angle of that. By the way, all these equations only describes the isotropic part of my uh, problem, okay? In principle, you have, um, you have to go further on if you want to describe, for example, the anisotropic part. Uh, and uh, one qualitative feature that you might expect is that in a diffusive propagation, the flux, whatever the injection is, tends to be isotropized, okay? You might have experienced this every time you open, for example, a bottle of parfum in a room. Uh, after a while, you smell the parfum a bit everywhere in the room. You don't know where it came from, right? So this is a typical diffusive process. At the end, you, you cannot track back easily where it came from, so you lose directionality. Uh, how to deal with that? The short answer, you run some numerical code. Hmm? The, the problem is that if you do it blindly, uh, sometimes you start violating some hidden assumptions in these numerical codes, and then you end up with some strange results and you don't know what to make of them. So in order for you to, to grasp some of the physics involved and why this is a very difficult search, it's a very powerful search in principle, but very difficult because it's very indirect. Uh, I will try to, to, to make some toy model, some simplification. We can solve it. And then I will show you how some type of particle fluxes, charged particle fluxes, depend on some astrophysical parameters, how dark matter ones depends on some simplified parameters, and how this is a very challenging uh, problem to tackle, what are the kind of parameters you might be sensitive to, and so on and so forth. So zero to order approximation. So the, the, the important thing in this messy uh, equation that I wrote is that in reality, if you move sufficiently high in energy, hmm, most of these effects go away, are very uh, irrelevant, okay? The main effects that matter are the diffusion, the spatial diffusion, and how it evolves depends on, uh, on the energy of your, or your particle, and the source. How many particles of that energy you inject in the medium? Hmm? So under this simplification, which on the basis of scaling argument, you can uh, expect to be good at high energies, well, you can just neglect everything else but the source term and the diffusion term. Hmm? So all this complicated diffusion uh, equation reduces to this simple, simple one, where you have a diffusion term and a source term. Point. Now, we are not happy yet. So we just parameterize this differential operator with some effective uh, uh, confinement time. And uh, uh, once we do that, we lose completely the um, information about the space dependence. But you may have this idea in mind that the diffusive medium looks a little bit like a box where from time to time there is a finite probability that my particle touches the border of the box and I lose it. So the, the main physical parameter is what's the confinement time of my particle within the box. Of course, once I do this step, I'm assuming that it's completely homogeneous within this, this sphere. Hmm? Now, this is like uh, out of the blue. I will show you that, in fact, you solve the diffusion equation and you get this behavior. Hmm? But uh, trust me for a second, at the end of the day, you can estimate what's the resulting flux, say, of protons or carbon nuclei or whatever else at the Earth, just if you knew the, um, the injected one, the source one, which, by the way, we don't know. We have guessed about that, but we don't know, times some effective confinement time, some diffusion time, that we have to estimate now. Okay, how do we estimate these, these parameters? One way to estimate, which is very, very popular in cosmic ray physics, is to use what is called secondary to primary diagnostics. Now, what does it mean? It's a complicated way to say that if you look at empirically what you measure in these high energy fluxes, is that uh, the abundances, the relative abundances of stuff like, uh, uh, say, uh, carbon or iron, etc., the relative ones are very similar to the relative abundances of carbon and iron, et cetera, that you find, say, in the solar system. So somehow, these cosmic rays seem to originate from a medium 
which is more or less similar in chemical composition to the solar system. But there are some exceptions. These exceptions are species like uh, lithium or uh, boron or beryllium or some more funny named uh, elements uh, which are underabundant in the solar system. Very, you have very little lithium in the solar system, but at the end of the day, you have like 10% of lithium or a few percent of lithium compared to the carbon in the, in, the, um, in the cosmic ray radiation. So the standard interpretation is, since the pattern of chemical elements in the, uh, in the overall distribution of cosmic rays is very similar to what we measure in the solar system, we think that the medium from which they have been accelerated is very similar to the solar system. So there is no lithium, there is no, no boron. However, since now this, whatever happens to this acceleration mechanism uh, has produced non-thermal radiation of, say, carbon, of oxygen, of iron, this non-thermal radiation has sufficient energy that once in a while, when interacting with gas, it can spallate. So you have phenomena like carbon plus hydrogen of the interstellar medium creating, say, boron plus X, and the same could happen to oxygen, to iron, etc. And you can create a, a lithium, etc., etc., etc. And so somehow it's the fact that this is a non-thermal radiation that uh, overpopulates these rare elements in the cosmic rays. If this hypothesis is correct, what does it mean that these, pro these, these objects here are only created during the propagation? So their Q is zero, their source term of the primary type is zero, and the only source term is the steady state flux of this type of elements. Hmm? This is an hypothesis. It looks reasonable, by the way, but uh, uh, let's test it. If it is true, what happens is that for primary species, let's say carbon, just to be specific, you have some unknown carbon source, times some unknown effective time parameter that depends in general on the energy. And this is the steady state carbon flux that you see at the Earth. Now you see also some boron flux, just to be specific. What is the boron flux? The boron flux is not proportional to Q boron, because there is no Q boron. It's zero at the source term. But there is some... Uh, boron coming from the fragmentation of this carbon in the interstellar medium. So it will be proportional, by known uh, coefficient, by the way, to what? To, f to the flux of the carbon times the same effective time. Because we are assuming that they diffuse the same way. These are charged particles. Once they have the same rigidity, they diffuse the same way. It's just an electromagnetic phenomenon. But flux of carbon goes as Q of, a, of carbon times the effective time, so you get the factor square. Times, of course, there is here some cross-section, right, for the probability for carbon to produce boron in a given medium of a given density, the NH, the density of the gas of interstellar medium. Once you do the ratio of boron over carbon, for instance, what do you get? You get rid of the unknown Q source term, and you get something which is proportional through known prefactors to the effective confinement time. Hmm? And that's the way, by comparing the observations to the, to the data, you try to determine these poorly known uh, astrophysical uh, or plasma astrophysics parameter, which is the effective diffusion time of species in the galaxy. Okay? This is the spirit. How do you try to... Uh, get out of this messy situation and get some physically meaningful parameters. Now, uh, I should uh, convince you that what I did as approximation is not so bad. It's at least consistent with the kind of equations that I wrote. And this is the, the, uh, the way to do so. So it's the sort of uh, diffusion model for a, for a theorist, a lazy theorist. So in the galaxy, the typical uh, length or the radius of the galaxy is, is much 
uh, larger than the thickness of the galaxy, right? So to a first approximation, I can consider the galaxy like a one-dimensional system where I don't care what happens at the, at the radial border. I just care about the, 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 uh, the z variable above and below the plane, okay? So again, I am in this approximation of high energy where I don't care about all these phenomena that only affect low energy. So I only have to write the diffusion term at the only important variable is the one perpendicular to the, to the plane, okay? So my equation, my complicated equation is reduced to something like that. And if the diffusion coefficient does not even depend on z, you get something second derivative of my uh, unknown flux or distribution function with respect to z derived twice is equal to a search term, which I can approximate like a delta function because the gas part is much thinner than the, the, the extent of the diffusive value. So I can write it as delta z times this thickness of the gas halo. Hmm? It's the sketch that I'm uh, uh, reporting there. And then, of course, you may have losses. You may have losses simply because these nuclei can interact with the gas and uh, can, can, can die, OK? And these losses are parameterized by this second term. You have the usual, by now you should be used to it, right? Sigma Vn times, again, you have the, the, the F, because this is a loss term for this, hmm? delta Z. And then you have, instead of, you have the 2H, hmm? so that this is uh, correctly uh, normalized. This is the equation that I can write to simplify my complicated three-dimensional propagation equation in the high energy regime once I focus on the only relevant variable. Now, when I'm at z different from zero, this one is very simple, right? It's just second derivative of f equal to zero. So I know what's the z dependence of f. The z dependence of f is just given by sort of i plus be z, and since it must be symmetric, I can also write it like that, above and below the plane. Now, because I have free escape boundary, okay, once my particle reaches the boundary, I assume that uh, the density of my particle goes to zero, I can impose that f goes to zero at plus h minus h, and this is how I determine the relative weight of the coefficient a and b. Hmm? And that's what I get. I get some unknown function of the momentum times a known function of the, the, the special uh, variables. Fine. Then I derive this expression with respect to, to z. I evaluate it in zero, or if you wish, zero plus. Hmm? The same would be true in zero minus. And I get another condition. Now I have only one unknown uh, function of the P, F0 of P, which is the distribution in momentum of my particles in the thin disk. But I know how this rescales as a function of Z. Now, this has to obey this condition. I, I can compute that. I can compute the F over the Z. Hmm? I impose this condition, and I get my results. I get my equation for FP. And surprise, surprise, my results write exactly the way I told you it should. It writes like a source term times an effective time. We, we recovered this sort of leaky box idea. Here it's a little bit more subtle because the leaky box is somehow dependent on where I am with respect to the galactic plane. Okay, it would look like a different confinement time if I am at zero uh, uh, height in the galactic plane or if I am at one kiloparsec away or one kiloparsec uh, sorry, one kiloparsec or two kiloparsec above or below the plane. But the logic is the same. So the toy model I was describing before is correct in this approximation. It's at least co coherent with a diffusive approximation where the diffusion coefficient does not depend on the, on the, on the location, is homogeneous, but might depend on the energy. Hmm? And that's it. The effective time now I can even estimate this is the other big advantage with respect to the uh, leaky box model I was describing before, where I had to determine by some other uh, clever idea. 
And now I can estimate it. It's just the, the inverse of the effective confinement time is determined by two time scales. One is the collisional time scale. is what I call T sigma, tau sigma there. It's just the typical um, interaction time on my particle. One over sigma Vn. Hmm? And I just plug in some reasonable uh, parameters for you to have an idea. This is of the order of 10 million years. And the other is the diffusion time scale that I uh, normalize to the same kind of uh, time scales to, to give you uh, the point at which these, these two phenomena are, are the same, which turns out to be at the, at the level of GV energies. Now, if you do now the same trick that I did before for secondaries, you would get exactly the results we got before for secondaries, because I proved that the solution now is nothing but the source term time times uh, the effective time. So you take the ratio and you determine the, the ratio of secondaries to primaries, just like the cross section times the density of the target material, which is, which is known stuff, right? Times the velocity. These are relativistic particles, so they must be C. Times H and little h there, which are unknown, over D, which is unknown. But what I can do is to take my unknown, which depends on the energy or the momentum, and this one I can fit to the data of, say, boron over carbon. So I have determined this combination of parameters. Now, if dark matter signal through antiprotons or positrons or what else only depended on the same combination of parameters, I wouldn't care more, right? I don't care really what's the value of this effective parameter H. I'm done. There is no uncertainty, if you wish. Unfortunately, if you do solve this little exercise, you will discover that even in this simplified model, once you compute now what's the flux that you expect in the thin plane, if I inject my source term not only in the thin plane, so I do not put my delta here, but I inject it everywhere, hmm, the dependence is different. Why this is important for dark matter? Because that's what dark matter does. There is a huge halo, and dark matter injects particles a little bit everywhere, not only where the matter is, not only where baryons are. And the results of this simple exercise is that you will discover that your flux scales like the source term, which you might know because of your theory, huh, times the effective time that you have determined empirically, but unfortunately, it still depends on things that you don't know. Because here I only know this combination. I don't know the other combination, right? So unless I find some other tools, there are bigger uncertainties in the signal calculations than the ones that I can fix by just observing other astrophysical observables. Okay. And this is the kind of difficulty that you see. Just to give you an idea, look at the kind of uncertainties that you have once you try to determine the, the limits from antiprotons, say. Okay? These are orders of magnitude. And the reason why they are orders of magnitude is that we do not know all the details of the astrophysics of this diffusive medium. And if you may wonder why we don't have after hundreds of years of progress in astronomy, the reason is that this is one of the rare cases where you want to do astronomy without directionality. And if you want to know where something comes from without knowing that it keeps its direction, you are screwed. You are completely blind. So the, it, the bottom line is directionality is the basis of quantitative astronomy since an, uh, ancient times. So that's the only thing I wanted to say. Uh, and qualitatively, if you now go to positrons and electrons, like many people have been working on, it's much worse than that. Why? Because electrons and positrons also lose energy through inverse Compton and through synchrotron onto interstellar light and onto um, um, uh, magnetic fields. Okay? And unfortunately, unfortunately, the time scales for this to happen are shorter than these 10 million years at energies above uh, a few GeV. So it means that basically you are only sensitive to local stuff. And for local stuff, 
All this funny model where you have an infinite plane and slab for the galaxy is bullshit, right? Because the galaxy doesn't look like that if you average over 100 parsec or 200 parsec. It looks highly inhomogeneous. So unfortunately, if you want to search for dark matter with electrons and positrons, you have to model very detailed way where the sources are, how the medium looks like, and what is worse is that some of the sources may be transient, and they might be gone. You don't see them anymore in gamma rays. But cosmic rays take maybe 10 million years to come to here. So maybe the sources that you are looking for are not there anymore. The only good thing is that there are sufficiently numerous sources in the galaxies we know about. Pulsars, pulsar wind nebulae, supernova remnants, etc., etc. That if you, if you are brave enough and you try to run a simulation of what the electron flux should look like, what the positron flux should look like, well, of course you have huge uncertainties. There is a sort of galactic variance that you cannot control because there are, uh, it's intrinsically a statistical exercise, okay? But you get that the data and the predictions are roughly comparable to the, uh, one another in a reasonable way. So we believe that at least in an average way or in a statistical way, we know that the high energy sources that we see, for example, in gamma rays, in radio waves, in X-rays, are capable of accounting for the fluxes of leptons. You can still use it to put bounds on dark matter uh, um, in a more uh, clever way in the sense that maybe dark matter produces a sharp edge in energy because dark matter only injects electrons and positrons up to its mass, okay? So if you, if you look for a sort of a triangular shape on the top of a smooth flux, maybe you can put bounds. And within this approximation, you do get some good bounds. But unfortunately, this is only true for some models. It's only true for some assumption. It's not very generic, okay? So just to, to conclude, uh, the question is now, can indirect methods really detect dark matter. Of course, as I try to, to convince you, uh, it's very unlikely that you can trust 100% an excess arising in one only of these channels I've illustrated. However, if you start having different pieces of information coming from different directions that make a coherent picture, you may hope to convince yourself that it's very hard to mimic what you're seeing with an astrophysical signal. So this is the best hope we have. Another hope that we have is that at some point, direct detection experiment or collider searches find something that looks like being compatible with dark matter. Hmm? If this is the case, maybe we don't need to search everywhere. We know more or less, we have a prior or where to look for. And there uh, we have hopes that we can narrow down somehow some uncertainty for a specific channel, for a specific energy, etc to such a level that you can see some signal. Anyway, even if you are not very um, happy about the, these difficulties and these astrophysical uncertainties, you need some indirect detection uh, tool. Why? Imagine that you find in a collider something that looks like missing energy. It looks like it might be some massive particle that does not interact. It does not interact on which time scales? Very short time scales. It escapes your detector, it's lost. How do you know if it's stable on cosmological time? How do you know that this is dark matter? Next time you hear LHC is looking for dark matter, he cannot look for dark matter. He can look for something that is consistent with being dark matter if whatever it's fine matches other indirect or direct uh, uh, signals. So you still need to go back to this kind of blackboard and, and derive some signals in direct or indirect detection. Otherwise, you will never know that you have discovered dark matter in the lab. And uh, that's, that's my summary, basically. I think that there are reasons to be optimists in the sense that we went a long way since the 80s where at the, at, we, we didn't even know if dark matter was baryonic, was non-baryonic. Maybe ordinary neutrinos could have been hold of the dark matter. Now we know that we should look for something a bit more exotic. I try to illustrate that there is plenty of possibility for this exoticity. And according to the possi possibility that, uh, that you impose, First, you have always to fulfill some empirical criteria. Should not be too collisional, should not be blah, 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 blah. Second, according to the context in which 
you develop your scenario for searching for dark matter, you have some possible signature. Could be direct detection, could be colliders, could be indirect detection. And then you hope to find uh, converging proofs of uh, something. Now, the good news is that you have many strategies. And uh, in terms of sensitivity, they are getting to the level where you should have had some chance of discovering dark matter if the most popular scenarios are correct. Hmm? The bad news is that the parameter space is so huge that there is no guarantee that the quest will be successful. So this is a good or bad news in the sense that uh, you may work on that for, uh, for centuries or, uh, uh, or not. Hmm? Uh, now, if you are very pessimist, remember this kind of problem has arisen in, in the past. You already discovered dark matter. There was some anomaly in gravity in the movement of Uranus, and people just playing with paper discovered that maybe if you add some unseen new body, you can account for it. Then uh, this theorist goes to his uh, experimentalist friend, we would put it in modern terms, and say, look at there, and he finds some, some planet. And this planet has been discovered electromagnetically, and they have the proof, because this is a picture. OK? Now, uh, OK, this is just to see that there has always been some politics uh, associated with uh, scientific discoveries. This is a cartoon mocking the British, French cartoon mocking the British, because you, know, you had Adams and Leverrier working on the same problem, and Adams could not find it, so he finally found in the notebook of Leverrier the planet. Right? But if you are, however, more open-minded, you can remember that sometimes you, you, you find surprises. right? You don't find what you expect. The same problem arises a few decades later. There is anomalies in the movement of Mercury. Nobody can account for. So OK, the trick worked once. Let's assume that there is some dark planet. We call it Vulcan. And we detect it like several times for decades till somebody cannot confirm the detection. And at the end, you had to change completely your paradigm in order to understand what was going on. So don't be too depressed. Be patient. Sometimes the discovery takes take very, very long time. And sometimes you discover something that you don't expect at all. Uh, and on that note, I think I can stop. <laughs>